Hello, welcome to ELEC 124 Computer System Fundamentals. This is lecture 10 on strings and characters. So let's begin with what are characters? Characters are simply 8 bit integer values. And each one of these integer values has a graphic or a glyph associated with it. This is like the picture that represents each of those integer values. We can refer to characters in two ways in the code, either through its integer value directly, in this case 84, or through its character literal value in single quotes t. And it is the latter way that is particularly useful when we are writing code, because it doesn't require us to memorize any particular integer value of a character. So one easy way to think about characters is to think about the extended ASCII table. Each character is a value from 0 to 255 and it represents a distinct picture or glyph from this table. As you can see capital T is right here and it has a value of 80 plus 4 84 in total. You can see that there's other useful things in the extended ASCII table which we can use as characters. These mainly are used for drawing, math, things like that. Very, very useful. Because there are 256 different values for characters, we can actually go ahead and print all of them in a 16 by 16 matrix. So I have some code here on the right hand side and it uses two for loops to accomplish this. Remember that we can get a value from 0 to 255 by combining our two counter variables i and j in the following way. You can think of i as being the row you are on, so going downwards, and you can think of j as being the column you are on going to the right. When you add j plus 16 times i, you'll get a value, a unique value from 0 to 255. And that's how we can actually go ahead and print all of the character values. Now if you look at the lecture notes here on the left and look at my screen here you'll kind of see something a little bit different that I don't have glyphs for these for the first set of characters here. We can change that very easily by right clicking our console window and using the legacy console. When you do that we can go ahead and rerun this code and now you'll get the familiar output that you see on the left hand side. Pretty cool. You'll also notice that some of these characters from here seem to be missing. So they are in fact not missing, however, there are additional uses for some of these lower ASCII characters. For instance, 10 and 13 are used for the new line and line feed characters. When you try to print them, the computer will actually just go onto a new line and not print any of these glyphs as you see here. Not a big deal, we can use our imagination there. One other key aspect to notice is that we have two different values of t. In the ASCII table you can see that we have a value for capital T at 84, but we also have a value of small t at 116. In our program we can go ahead and print capital T in two different ways. We can print it either as a character which will show up as T, the glyph, or as a integer value, which will be 84. And we can do the same thing for small t as well. What happens if we have characters that are hard to display, or otherwise have no glyph associated to them? Well, we cannot refer to them using our character literal approach as we have done here, because those characters are inherently untypable. And this is where escape sequences come into play. They allow us to refer to these special characters in a different way. We've already been using escape sequences every single time we use the function printf. Slash n is the most recognizable escape sequence and represents the new line character. Thus, it shouldn't surprise you that we can find its integer value using a bit of code. Let's do that now. Let's declare a character called newLine. 
and let's give it the value of slash n. Remember that slash n is the escape sequence, and everything in the quotation here will be a character. So this will represent the new line character. Let's go ahead and just print it now as an integer. The new line character is percent %d, and we can go ahead and put new line here. Let's run this code and see what happens. Not surprisingly, the code runs, and we get a value of 10 for our new line character. Cool. Here are some examples of characters and their associated literal and integer values. Capital A has a value of 65, and we've already found out that the new line character, which has a escape sequence of slash n, has an integer value of 10. We can do the same thing for the carriage return and the null terminator, two commonly used characters, to find out that their integer values are 13 and 0. However, like prior, it is most useful to represent these by their character literals, so you do not have to memorize these numbers. It also makes for cleaner code. And lastly, I've included a Unicode character, which will be encoded in four bytes. But just what is Unicode? So let's take a look at the ASCII table and realize that it is very, very limited. We only have eight bits, which represents 256 different characters. And this is where Unicode was developed. It was developed to extend the character sets in a very standardized way. And one particular important aspect about Unicode is that the UTF-8 encoding was introduced and it is backward compatible with our 8-bit ASCII. And this is the most popular form of Unicode encoding. There's a full history available at this link if you are interested in reading. So Unicode's UTF-8 encoding is really just a variable multibyte encoding. Okay? It is the most popular and generally has this form. You do not need to memorize this. This is just a little bit of a look behind the scenes to see what's happening. Each of these X's will represent part of the Unicode code point, and there will be an integer value that will be fit into all of these. With UTF-8, we can encode the entire Unicode character set, which roughly amalgamates to 1,100,000 characters. Um, however, whenever we print in Unicode, we always have to convert from Unicode to some encoding. And this is where I have provided a little bit of a magic function, so you do not have to do this. Um, there's a really good lookup table for Unicode uh, that has some familiar icons in it. Something you might see in your WhatsApp or Telegram applications. They all have Unicode code points. Um, now, I'm going to go ahead and print these in Windows. However, Unicode support is very poor in the Windows console. Now, we can download what's called Windows Terminal in order to fix this. And then we can go ahead and print all of our favorite emojis. Emojis are really just Unicode characters and can be copied and pasted around just like text, each one of them. Uh, however, it is the application and the font plus the encoding that determines how it looks finally on the screen. So let's go ahead and download us Windows Terminal. You can find this in the Microsoft Store on your Windows PC. If you do not have a Windows PC, I am sure you can find an alternative for you. Um, so let's go ahead and print all of the emojis between these UTF code points. Now. I'm going to go ahead and show you what that looks like, and I hope that looks pretty mesmerizing. So let's see how I did this. We'll start with some boilerplate code that helps us display Unicode characters on the Windows Terminal application. There's a UTF encoding function that I have written for you called encode as UTF-8, and it will help us translate the Unicode code points into UTF-8 encoded byte streams. Also, we will utilize the set console output CP function, which will allow Unicode characters to show up on the screen when encoded with UTF-8. This is provided by the Win32C API 
and is made available through the windows.h header. Next we see that I have five rows of 16 columns for a total of 80 printed characters. The first one will be in hexadecimal 1f600. So we can declare a variable here called int base and give it a value of 1f600. By using a nested for loop, we can iterate through all 80 characters in the following way. We'll first start with a loop that encapsulates the rows, followed by another loop that will encapsulate the columns. And we can compute our Unicode code point as we move along in this two-dimensional matrix as being the result of an equation. This equation will simply be our base plus 16 multiplies by our row plus our j. We can assign this into a new variable called code point. Next, we can encode this code point as a UTF encoded byte stream. Now in order to do that, I will already tell you that we require five characters to be stored. So I will go ahead and create a new array called encoded and give it five characters to work with. Then we will call our magic function and say that the output is going to be into this array and which code point are we going to encode? It will be our emoji that is available through this lookup. And finally we will print our emoji in the following way. We'll print it as a string and we'll just go ahead and grab the name and put it right there. At the end of every line, we will go ahead and put a new line character just so this goes to the next line. So it will print 16 and then new line and then another 16 and then another new line, etc., etc. Okay, let's go ahead and run this function, this program, and let's see what happens. Whoa, what happened? Well, we got our characters, but it doesn't look, look like they're being interpreted correctly. Well, we actually forgot to run it in the Windows Terminal app. So to do so, you need to start your Windows Terminal, which will look like this. Next, you will need to find the location of your executable, which in this case I've already done, so here. Copy its address and type it into the Windows terminal with a CD command prior. That will change our directory to be in that long, long, long directory. If I take a quick peek here, I can see that I have all of those executables here available for me to use. You can see that with the ls or dir commands, which will list all the files in this, di in this directory. And now it remains to run this program, which we can just do by typing its name in and pressing enter. And voila, we have our characters here, exactly as you see in the lecture notes. Pretty cool. We can display more characters by simply changing which of these code points we are actually printing. Um, when you go online, you can simply type in emoji code points or emoji unicode and you'll get this number for whatever character you want to display. Pretty cool. And there are thousands and thousands of them. Anything that you can display on your WhatsApp or on your Telegram, they are all characters from Unicode. Now we did something very interesting in this code. We declared an array of five characters called encoded. Now this is commonly known as a string. A string is just an array of characters and you can declare them in the exact same way you would any other array. You can also use them in the same way with each element being an individual 8-bit character now. So one particular aspect about C strings as they are called is that they are null terminated. We'll come back to this shortly.
So let's take a look at a string that is initialized with the word hello. Because it is really an array, each character has both a unique address in memory and an integer value at that memory location. Each element of the string can also be accessed using regular indexing, as you can see here. This table here should summarize what you should think of when you are thinking of strings. Earlier, I said that strings need to be null terminated. What does this mean? Well, we know that we must have a null terminator somewhere in the array. And we know that its integer value must be equal to zero, and its escape sequence, not surprisingly, is slash zero. The null terminator is really just a way of determining the length of a string. Let's remember that the length of the string is different from the size of the array. The size of the array determines the maximum number of characters that you can store, while the length of the string really determines how many of them are you using now. These are two different but related concepts. An unterminated string is very dangerous and often leads to reading and writing out of bounds. And this is because all of the string functions that we will learn depend on the null terminator being present. The functions will typically blindly scan a string until it finds the null terminator. If you only allotted say 100 spaces for the string, then it's possible that the function will scan beyond its allocated space. And if the operating system doesn't catch you and you somehow succeed in reading, then now you could be potentially writing out of bounds, especially when doing string manipulations and other operations. This leads to crashes very, very quickly. Okay, so let's see how we can print strings. As you could have guessed it, we can use the format specifier percent %s to print strings using the function printf. But we can also print into a string using a familiar function, a cousin to printf, called sprintf, where the s stands for string. There's another cousin called fprintf that can be used for printing into files. And if we want to print only the first n characters from a string, we can also use the percent %s format specifier, but with the precision and width set to both n, and in this case, 8. So percent %8.8s will print only the first 8 characters of the string. This is pretty, pretty useful. And this is common across the entire printf family of functions, which is very, very big. So this printf family of functions looks like this. We have scanf, fscanf, sscanf, we have vsscanf, we have printfs, uh, s printf, f printf, v printfs. All of these do different things. Very, very related functions, and we have their cousins for wide characters. We haven't studied these, but you can think of these as 16 bit characters. Now, the printf family of functions is available in almost all languages. They actually derive from C. C was the one to start this trend with printf, and all of the other languages adopted this because it was a very good way to print things. They all use very, very similar syntax. So if you ever find yourself in another language and you want to print something, you can just look up printf for your language. Most likely it will be there. Now that we've seen how we can print strings, let's look at how we can get strings as input. Not surprisingly, we can use our familiar scanf function to read a string from the user. However, there's another more advanced and preferred way, which is fgets. So the main difference here is that scanf will not work for multiple words in a sentence. Anything that is separated by a space, scanf will only capture the first word and leave the rest in the buffer. And fgets will capture multiple words, but will also capture the new line character when you hit enter at the end. So these are two distinct 
differences between scanf and fgets. I would like you to use fgets wherever possible. And let me illustrate why. When we use scanf, such as in this example here, what would happen if I would were to type more than 24 spaces into this string when we are doing user input? So let's go ahead and run that. Uh, let's go ahead and type something really long. And as you can see, I get a, a nice little error. Now, because we're in debug mode, we'll get this error pop up. If we were to be in release mode, we would most likely get a crash with some very cryptic messages about, you know, can't read and write to some random address. Okay? Now, I would like you to use fgets as a replacement for this when we are using strings, like so. In this example, fgets requires you to give the string as its first parameter and the number of maximum characters to capture from the std input stream. STD in is part of the standard set of streams that all programmers should be familiar with. Here's a quick crash course on it. There are three main channels that are used to pass data to and from programs. These are called standard streams. The keyboard will pass data to the STD input stream, which your program will read from using the fgets function, as you can see here. And your program will be able to pass data to the std out stream whenever you use the printf family of functions. All of this will appear on the screen. The advantage of having streams is when we deal with chaining and redirection of streams. Here's a quick example of that. Program 1 will receive user input from the keyboard and its output will be redirected to program 2. When it outputs it into program 2, program 2 will read it from its input stream, but program 1 will write, write to the output stream. So we have connected an input to an output. This process repeats for program 3. And in all three programs, we can see that the std error stream will output errors directly to the screen. This is important because we don't want the errors to be redirected to the input of programs 2 and 3. Instead, it appears on the screen completely separated. So coming back to our example here, we want to read from the std input stream, std in, and we want to store the result in username up to a maximum of 24 characters. This function will always, like all C function, handle the null terminator for you. However, one aspect of this function is that when you hit the enter key for some input, the enter key will be captured as well. And we could use the next function here, strtok, tok is token, to remove the trailing new line character. This is how I want you to do the user input uh, whenever we are dealing with strings. So let's take a look at some user input pitfalls. Keeping in mind that user input is not a simple problem, there are a lot of different ways in which we could mess it up and cause crashes. So let's take a look at some of the more common ones. Wrong pointer types passed to scanf and wrong buffer sizes given to fgets. Let's take a look at those right now. A wrong pointer type you can think of as anytime you have let's say a variable that is a float and you want to do some sort of scanf operation and let's say that now you are putting scanf and you're telling it percent %d instead of instead of percent %f. Well, because the storage size of an integer and a float is the same, this won't cause a crash, but it is an error. You cannot read proper variables like this. And to prove to you, let's go ahead and try to print this value. The value we entered is percent %f. And let's just go ahead and print test here and run this code. So I'm going to go ahead and enter in the number 56. Enter. <laughs> and somehow we get 0. OK, but let's do it the other way around. Let's make this an integer. And let's make this uh, a floating point number. And let's put, print this as an integer now. So in the reverse way, an integer where we are expecting a float and vice versa. So now let's enter in some other number. 
and we get some integer number. Well, as you can see, it doesn't crash, but it is wrong, right? And this is because we need the type of this variable, this integer here, to be reflected in the format specifier of scanf. It's very easy to get this wrong. For wrong buffer size, we can also draw up a quick, a quick example of that as well. So let's go ahead and make a string with 32 elements. And let's do f get s into name. And let's say we had here 48 characters at max. As you can see now, as you can see now, we are attempting to write up to 48 characters into name, but we've only allocated 32 spaces. So let's see how this could potentially go unfound for a long time. So let's go ahead and enter in my name. Hey, look, see, it works. No crash. But if we enter the right user input, something that is pretty, pretty long, let's go ahead and put in something that's definitely more than 32 characters, uh, I get a nice little crash here, a nice little error. And as you can see, these kind of things can go unfound for a long time, especially if the programs are very complicated, very long. You can see how this would be very, very problematic. An erroneous user input is also um, problematic. And we can do a quick example here as well. Um, let's say if we had, for some reason, we are entering, we want to enter uh, the age of the user. So we say printf, please enter your age, and scanf, and we do a percent %d and age. And then we say printf, you are percent %d age years old. Uh, and the variable that we want to print here is age. All right, cool. Um, so, um, pardon me. I forgot my ampersand here. So let's go ahead and enter our age. And I'm going to enter age. My age is BU. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's that's obviously wrong, as you can see. But nothing nothing here syntactically is wrong, right? This is a runtime error because we've told the program to do something very, very bad. And again, these kind of things can go unfound for a long time, especially if the program is very complicated. There are a few other ways in which we can um, create errors, and that is by forgetting to clear the std in buffer. So we remember that when we use the scanf function, the scanf function will typically leave the new line character in the std in buffer. And what would happen if you try to read another character now, when we try to read a character now, the character that got left in here, so this leaves a character behind, will automatically go into this one. So let's try to do that. Char uh, something. And we're going to try to read a single character followed after our integer. So let's, let's actually even put a printf statement here so it's clear. Please enter uh, a character. So let's do that. Normally, as you might think, we might be able to uh, read this character in two stages, right? So the user input would go in two stages. You would enter in your age, and then you would enter in a character. Let's go ahead and see what happens. So here is my age. I'm going to put uh, 45. And, whoa, wait a minute. It's not asking me for a character. What happened? Well, when I pressed enter here, when I was putting in this user input, the 45 gets converted into an integer and stored in the variable age. However, the new line character cannot be stored with age. It doesn't make sense. It's not an integer. The new line character gets left behind in the std in buffer, but the next scanf, when it executes, automatically looks in the buffer and says, hey, you've typed something to me already. And we'll go ahead and retrieve that character already without 
you having to enter it again. So when I when it asks you please enter a character, it automatically finishes very quickly. Let's try to print what character that is. And I'm going to also print it here. And let's try this again. I will enter in 45. Whoa, 10. What is 10? Well, if we refer to our old escape sequences and we look at the number 10, we can see that that number 10 was one of the new line characters. It has a value of 10. Pretty cool. So this is another way which we can cause failure. There are two more ways which I won't give examples for, but changing the pointer starting position or manually moving the terminator position somewhere that is illegal. These will all call, cause the user input to fail and you will likely get crashes or even worse, silent failures that you won't go undetected, that will go undetected for years. Let's take a look at some common string functions. The most common by far is strlen, which is just an abbreviation for string length. It computes the length of the string based on where the null terminator is in the array. For example, for a character array of 100 elements, the length of the string will be anywhere from 0 to 99, again, depending on where the null terminator is in that array. Next, we have two string concatenation functions, strcat and strncat. The only difference between them is that one will concatenate the entire string, while one will concatenate only n characters of that string. You can think of concatenation as adding two strings together. To compare strings, we can use strcmp or string compare function, which will compare for equality, but also let us know the ordering of these two strings. Imagine if the strings were ordered in a dictionary, which one would appear first? This is called lexical or alphabetical ordering. If we want to copy parts of the string to one another, we can use strcpy. Again, this also has an strncpy counterpart to only copy n characters. Searching for strings is also easy. We can use strstr function. This will let us know whether or not we have a substring inside of a larger string. And finally, we can split strings into tokens using the string token function. This is useful to separate parts of a string into different pieces based on some delimiter, such as a comma or a space. So let's attempt to combine our knowledge of strings and characters into a single program. Let's create a program that will accept a large piece of text from the user and compute word metrics on it. We want to compute the number of vowels. We want to compute the average words per sentence. We want to also compute a histogram of the letters. And finally, we want to also print the original text in eight columns, with each column having eight characters max. We can use the introductory paragraph from some popular novels as the user input. So it should look something like this. OK. Let's begin. Let's go back to the requirements here. And I'm going to start with a little bit of template code here. All it is is the STDIO and, and string headers included, an empty main body, and the sample piece of text that we will be using. In order to attack a problem like this, I think it's best to split the problem up into smaller pieces. We can do that using functions. So. Naturally, the first question here to count the number of vowels, we can abstract that into a function. So let's go ahead and declare some function prototypes here. We will have to define these functions later, but for now it's good to just get an idea of how they're going to work. Counting the number of vowels seems to be an integer task, so we can make our function return an integer, and we will call it get num vowels. Because we want to operate on a text, we should have a input here that will be a character array, a string. Okay, next, 
count the average words per sentence. Okay, in the similar way, average words would be some kind of a floating point value. So we can declare this function to have a return value of float. We will call it get average words. And again, it's going to receive a string input. To compute a histogram of the letters, what we really want to do is we want to return an array. However, we can't really return arrays in the traditional way. So we will do something a little bit different. Let's call this function get histogram. And again, it's going to operate on the same input, but we will add another argument to this parameter. And I will call it frequency, and there will be 26 elements in that. So, right now I have a prototype called get histogram that will accept a pointer here, which is really just uh, a string in this case, and will accept another array, which will point to an array of 26 elements, integers. Um, once we get the histogram, we can also print the histogram, because these will be two separate operations. And when we print the histogram, let's pass the result from our previous calculation as an input here. And finally, the last thing which we want to do is print the long text in eight columns. So let's go ahead and create another function called print column text. Because it's going to operate directly on the, on the user input, let's declare that pointer called input to, to refer to that string. And let's configure it with the number of columns and how wide will each column be. So next we have to write these functions, but I think it's a little bit easier if we write how they will be used first before we write them themselves. So let's go ahead and do that now. We want some user input, and because it's going to be a long piece of text, I'm just going to go ahead and allocate 1024 slots to it and initialize them all to be zero. We'll call this our long piece of text. Next we want to ask the user for his story. Let's do that now. And we can do a fgets, as we have learned. Use our text to be our text string here as the target to store it in. We have 1024 max characters to write, and we'll read from the std in file stream. Once we have that, we will do our little trick here to get rid of the enter key. Next, let's do some basic analysis. The number of vowels will be returned by this function called getNumVowels. So we can go ahead and directly assign that to a new integer called numVowels and give this function our user input, in this case just the text. We can do the same thing for finding the average words. So the average length here will be get average words and text as the input. Great. Um, let's go ahead and actually print this. I'm just going to put a new line here at the beginning so that our story will be separated from uh, the results. We'll call this number of vowels and I'm going to say percent %d because it will be an integer and I will print num vowels here. Next, I will do the same thing for the average sentence length. And we will print that as a float because average length here, our variable, is a float. We can pass the variable average length to our printf function in order to print it properly. Great. That's already one and two done. Awesome. Let's do some more advanced analysis here. I'm going to declare 
an array of 26 elements here and again give them a value of 0 to begin with. We will use this as the output for our histogram function. So let's go ahead and use our histogram function. in the following way. First we print that we're going to print the histogram and now we're going to compute the histogram here. So we're going to say get histogram and because this is a void function up here we realize that we do not need to assign this return value to anything. It wouldn't make sense. We can give the histogram our piece of text and where to store the frequency components of that histogram, the bins. Uh, once we have them we want to print them separately as well. So we will call print histogram function and we'll give our output here to that. R remember that the get histogram function will take text as input and output and write into this array here. Now we pass this array to the print histogram function which will take this and print it. Okay. And now finally we will do some advanced printing. I'm going to tell the user what we are printing in. Eight columns, eight characters max. And we'll call our print column text. We will give this function our piece of input and two parameters, eight and eight, which represents the number of columns and the number of characters in each column at most to print with. And this concludes our part in main. This is why function prototypes are very useful because they allow us to abstract away what this code is doing without even writing what these functions will do. We just know that somehow these functions will work. Now, if I were to r run this program, pardon me, if I were to compile this program, before I do that, let me switch my project. If I were to compile this program, you will see that the linker will complain that, hey, you've defined me these functions, but you have not given them to me. Where is the code for it? That's what this is saying. Okay, so let's go ahead and start writing some of these functions. This function will return the number of vowels. Okay. So in order to write this function, the first thing that I always do is I copy the prototype, get rid of the semicolon, very, very important, and I will put two braces here to begin with. Okay, inside of this function, uh, I know that I have to traverse the entire string. So let's go ahead and do that now. We can use the string length function and we can give the input directly to it. This will iterate over each character in that array or in that string, if you please. For instance, we know here that it will be up to 1024 characters max, but this number could be, let's say, 50, if that's how many characters we put in. And now we need to check which vowels we have. Now, just as a reminder, vowels are A, E, I, O, U, and Y. I'm going to include Y, even though the convention is that sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. But let's just go ahead and include it for simplicity, as this is not the issue of, the, of this function. All we want here to do is count the number of times we have an E, an A, an I, O, U, and a Y. So let's go ahead and figure out how to do that. I can directly read each character and index it with i, like this. So when I grab a string and I index it with i, I will get a character, and I can compare if that character is equal to, let's say, capital A. Hmm. But also, I can do it if I have a lowercase a. So both of these cases are possible. And if that's the case, I want to keep a sum, a tally of the number of vowels which we have. So let's go ahead and give a sum up here equal to zero. And if we encounter a capital A or a capital or a lowercase a, I want to increment sum. Okay, let's repeat this process for all the other ones we have. A, E, I, O, U, 
and y. Now I'm taking a little bit of a shortcut here because usually I would have told you to write code like this. But in this case, it is convenient to do it like this. And this is because it is m visually more pleasing on the eye. If we reach any of these vowels, increment sub. Very, very clear. However, at the end of this for loop, we need to return sub. Because otherwise, what are we doing with this value that we've just computed? We need to return it out of the function. Okay, that will be our first function. Now let's compute the average words that uh, per sentence that we have in our text. How can we do that? Starting from our, starting in the same way we did get num vowels, I'm going to copy the prototype for it, and I'm going to remove the semicolon and add two braces here. Obviously, I want to iterate over the entire string again, so let's go ahead and reuse this bit of code that we did up here. And again, add two braces for this for loop. How do we count sentences and how do we count words? Well, we know words are going to be separated by a space, so we can go ahead and look for spaces. Remember, input at i is a character. This is our string here. So when when we look for a space and we find it, we can go ahead and make some magic here and say this would be word count plus plus. We don't have a word count variable, but we can just as well add one very easily. Let's give it a starting value of zero. If we have a, a period, then we can go ahead and increase our sentence count. And again, we would need some kind of variable up here that will store our sentence count. And finally, at the end, what we want to do is just take the ratio of these two numbers. Let's go ahead and do that and then see what happens. Now because word count is an integer and sentence count is an integer, when we do this division we have integer division, which is not what we want. Even though the return value is a float, remember that the float will only get its value from the result of this integer division. So it's the integer division that we need to fix, not the return value. Quick easy way to do that is to just multiply this by 1.0 and then let bed mass take care of the rest and we will get our correct value in the end. Perfect. Let's look at the next function now. Our next function that we have to write is get histogram. Let's do that. Again, we copy the function prototype. This function will compute the letter histogram. Okay, remember to remove the semicolon and start with two braces. One really good thing to do here is to iterate over this entire array and just reinitialize all the values to be zero. Let's do that now. can go ahead and create a for loop with the counter variable i that runs between 0 and 26. And here we will say that the frequency at i equals 0. All this does is clear the histogram. Remember that this is an array that was passed into our function from outside. We have initialized it here to 0, but we could have just as easily not initialized it. The fact that our function clears it is very good code. It means that the user doesn't have to be bothered doing this. He could just be a little bit more lazy here and it makes the code a little bit cleaner. Next we want to check for if we have A's, B's, C's, anything between A and Z. How do we do that? Well first of all we need to look through the entire string and we can utilize our familiar function, our familiar for loop, pardon me, that we did earlier. And again, you can see why string length is such an important function. And here's where some magic happens. Um, I can do something like this. 
I can check to see that the input is greater than capital A and input or the character that I'm scanning is smaller than or equal to capital Z. If this is the case, then what do I want to do? Well, if it's A, if the input was A, then this is true. And I want frequency of 0 to be the one that gets incremented if my input was A. So I can do a quick calculation here. So let's go ahead and realize that the bidding here for frequency will work like this. For 0 will represent A. But as you can see, A here will have a value in ASCII. We don't know what that value is. I know what it is, but let's assume we don't. All we can do to figure out the offset is take the character value and subtract A from it. This might seem a little bit strange, but remember that this A is really just 65. So if we subtract 65 from it, all the A's, the character A's, will have a value of 0. This, cal this calculation here will have a value of 0. Pretty cool. And instead of writing code with some weird offset 65 that we have no idea what it is, it's more common to write A here. Great. But what about the lower cases? Well, for the lower cases, we could do the exact same thing. So now, do we want to return frequency? No. Frequency is already an external array. We don't need to touch it. We can modify it using these commands here, but we do not need to return it. We are finished with this function. OK. Let's look at the next one here, print histogram. This will print our results. And again, because this is a function prototype, we want to do we want to write the definition. We can go ahead and get rid of the semicolon, add two braces here. Okay. So how do we print this? Well, what I want to print, just generally, is gonna be something like this. I want to print A, B, C, D, E, F, G, all the way up to Z. Okay. Well, let's start with the fact that we want to print 26 characters. And I want to print them such that they have three, that they take up three spaces each. So I'm going to go ahead and tell you that we can accomplish that very easily. Percent 3C. This will print our character in three spaces. Because characters always occupy one space, this will leave two blank spaces to the left of it. And then, which value do we want to print? Well, if we print I, it'll print the character that represents 0, which is the null terminator. We don't want that. What we do want to do is we want to print capital A plus I. And remember that this capital A plus I will result in some new integer. When I is 0, it'll print A. When I is 1, this will print B. I hope that is clear. After this, we want to print a new line. And finally, we want to print the frequency content. The frequency content was passed to our function using this frequency variable here. So let's go ahead and do the exact same thing. Let's print up to 26 entries. But instead now of printing, um, printing the character, we will print from this array instead. And again, to align it to be three spaces, from the left, we will use percent %3D. And we will use frequency at I to get the value in the array for that character. Remember that 0 here represents A. So frequency of 0 is some integer that represents the number of times the character A has appeared. And just for conciseness, we will put another new line character here, just to space things out. At this point, I wrote a lot of code, and it's a good idea to run this code. It is, as you can see, it's still complaining about one last thing, which is the print column text. 
Because we haven't written it yet, let's go ahead and comment this part out. We just want to see if this runs so far. Let's go ahead and build our solution one more time. One succeeded, zero failed. Perfect. Let's grab our user input and run our program. Gave me a long story. I'm going to put in my story there. And I hope you can see we've got the exact same thing so far. Hey, that's pretty cool. All right, so let's do the last one, which is the most complicated one. But it should be fairly easy if we take it step by step. What we did prior was we copied the function prototype and we bring it down here to write. Print the text in call columns each with width characters. Remember to move to remove the semicolon here and we can start with two braces. At this point we need to use the string token function. Remember that the string token function really splits up a string into multiple pieces. Each piece is called a token and the pieces are separated by delimiters. So for instance the quick brown fox can be split up into the quick brown fox with spaces being as the delimiters and the words between being as the tokens. So really they are just pieces. Now the string token function looks a little bit confusing at first because it requires you to execute it multiple times in succession. But let's go ahead and see how that works. I'm going to make a pointer here and it's going to be called next piece. And it's going to be assigned the result of the string token function which we will pass our original piece of text into and what our delimiter is going to be. In this case, it's going to be a space. Now, I'm going to go ahead and go through a loop because I'm expecting that we are going to have multiple results here. So as long as my character pointer is not equal to, to the null pointer, which is a special way of indicating that there are no further tokens left, we can go ahead and iterate in this loop. And at the end of this loop, we want to go to the next token or piece. And here's where the magic really happens. The next piece, this pointer will be overwritten with another result from the string token function. But this time we will put the null pointer in there and we will keep our delimiter to be the same. In this case, we can go ahead and print everything that comes out of this function. Each token will be in this variable called next piece. So let's go ahead and print that as a string. And I'm going to go ahead and just do this. I'm going to go ahead and print the string return for my tokens. And I don't want all this other stuff here. All I want is the last piece here. So let's go ahead and just test this minimum set of boilerplate code to get the string token function to work. I'm going to say the quick brown fox jumped over the lazy dog. And as you can see, each one of these words got split up separately as a token. And we have not gone into any infinite loops here. This is the usage, the basic usage of the string token function. Now we want here to print in eight columns, it says. Hmm, okay. Well, we have our piece of text here. How do we now keep track whether or not we have printed up to eight times? Well, every time we print, can't we just increment some count, some kind of counter? We'll call this column count, and all we're going to do is just simply increment this. Because column count is an undeclared variable, we can go ahead and declare it up here and give it a value of zero. When we have reached 8, if column count is bigger than or equal to the number of columns that we have, we can go ahead and simply print a new line. At the same time, we can reset our column count to be equal to 0. This will take care of everything we need. 
And as you can see, we can even do better by shortening these. And I'm going to do the following and put these in one line. That's what this piece of code here will do. Every eight columns will go to a new line, and that is if column has a value of eight. Perfect. We also want to go to a new line if we can find a period in our sentence. For instance, remember that as we break apart this text into tokens, this space and this space here will be captured, but the period will not. We want to end after a period. We want to go to a new line. We want to end the line. Okay, so we can do that here. Let's add a nice little comment that we will start a new line if we find a period. All right, so how do we do that? We can utilize the string substring search, str, str. We can go ahead and search inside of next, to next piece, which is our token, and really we are just searching for the period. And I'm going to say that this is not equal to zero to mean that we have found some kind of a search somewhere down the line. This means that the result of this function was not equal to the null pointer, which in this case is just really a way of saying this. And if that's the case, I have the same consequence as when I went to eight columns. I print a new line and clear my column count. Okay, let's go ahead and see what that looks like here. Looks like it's doing what we want. We didn't test eight columns just yet, but let's go ahead and do that now. And as you can see, after eight, after eight words, we have a new line here. Okay, so it looks good. But what about the actual printing of the token itself, of our piece? We don't just want to print token, colon, token, colon. We want to arrange it nicely. So let's start with a simple printing of this token. If I go ahead and just print percent %s, um, that's not too bad. But I want to print really just up to 8 characters at most. And I'm going to put a space before and a space after with a vertical bar here to indicate divisions. Let's go ahead and run that code again now. Okay, this looks good. It looks like we don't need our new line character here anymore, but it's starting to get better. Let's rerun that again here. Aha, looking good. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and then it goes to the next line. Okay. Pretty cool. What about the sentences that have periods in them? Well, instead of me running this code and manually typing in what I want, let's just go ahead and grab our full input text and pop it into this text input field here. As you can see, we have all of our words separated here. But as you can see, they are right aligned. They are not left aligned. So okay, so we need to go ahead and make another adjustment. The left aligned a string whenever we print it, we must put a little dash here. This dash will allow us to left align the, the string and it'll make everything look much more prettier. Let's go ahead and put the user input back in and see what came out. Aha! Looks very very good. Now as you can see there are some words that were not printed correctly. For instance, what is this? Excitement. Excitement. This is too long. According to our program requirements, Whenever we have something that is too long, what we want to do is we want to reduce its width and put dot dot dot. This is to make it fit and to let the user know that there are more characters there. So how do we do that? Well, we can do something here that's kind of interesting. Imagine for a second that we could change this to 5-5 five, five, and then add the three dots manually. Well, how about we put an if statement here? 
we can check if the size of the string of our token or our piece if it's less than width remember width is going to be eight characters in this case if it's less than the width then we can go ahead and print the entire thing otherwise we can go ahead and print a truncated version of it and as you can see the truncated version will look like this and we'll have three dots here even though these look a little bit different believe me they will print very nice text let's grab our sample input and paste it into our program and aha voila we can see that at most we only have eight characters here if it doesn't fit with eight characters then we will have these three dots and we will reduce this token by three pretty cool one trick here is that I want to pass in the columns and I want to pass in the width but as you can see the width here 8 is being used in a hard-coded manner how can I combine this with this in such a way that makes it so these 8's really come from this well if you are good with printf's and format specifiers you will know that there are percent star format specifiers which will allow you to read that value in from some other parameter that gets passed to the function and in this case 5 5 will also turn into star star but because the widths have to be smaller I can go ahead and subtract 3 from them because we need to account for the three characters of the ellipsis print up to eight characters and replace with ellipsis if too long okay this should this should be our final code now let's go ahead and give it a run I'm gonna copy the user input and I'm gonna go ahead and run this code and paste it all in and see what happens voila it worked it looks the exact same as before but now look what we have done we can change how this works if it prints in eight columns how about I want six columns with six characters max look how powerful this code will become now as you can see there's a lot of words that are longer than six characters so you will see a lot of dot dot dots it's very hard to read this but nevertheless our function is more modular these the six and the six here actually do something they change the behavior of our function to tie it all back together we can go ahead and uncomment everything that we commented before and this is our final piece of software not too bad right let's run it one more time to make sure it works and that should be it looks pretty good I give it an A plus does it look the same as what we've got on the screen yep pretty much looks the same as the final program in our lecture we're gonna learn to draw some cards we're going to draw cards using Unicode characters and we're going to draw them according to the user input. The user can enter in one of the suits and some number from 2 to 10 or the characters A, K, Q, and J for Ace, King, Queen, and Jack. And just for fun, we'll make the cards bounce around like in the popular game Solitaire. So let's see how we can do this. I'm going to start up here with some function prototypes because this is where I'm going to encapsulate some abstract functions that I will write later. But we will imagine what they will be doing. For instance, I want at least something that can draw cards. Or let's say draw card, because it, it will be singular. Uh, which card do I want to draw? Well, we can pass that in as a parameter, which number, and which suit. Maybe we can pass in the suit as a character. That would be a bit more fitting, wouldn't you say? Also, we want to draw it somewhere on the screen. So I'm going to give it an int x and an int y to work with. All right. Now we need at least a couple of other functions that are very important. For instance, we want something to clear the screen. There are no parameters that we will need to pass to this function. Because we will be drawing in Unicode, um, we want to draw some characters we need to include the windows.h library and we can 
like before, set our code page to use UTF-8. So, um, now I would want to clear the screen. And then I want to draw some cards. So let's imagine hypothetically that I want to draw some cards. We'll call it, uh, let's draw 14. Um, let's do, let's do 10 instead. Or let's do 9. Why not? Let's draw the number 9. Let's draw spades. And let's draw him at 2 and 2. And then we want to return 0. So I have a... I have a mini program here, doesn't really do much yet, but this is just how I can build up my program. So as you can see, I haven't actually written the draw card function. Let's do that now. Well, what I want to do really is I want to take care of drawing of some boxes. Now I can do a quick Google search. And I can find some Unicode characters to help me draw some boxes. Look, look how many I have to choose from. There's a lot of them. All right. Well, let's see if we can pick some of these that will be useful. I think that the ones that are most useful, if I want to draw some kind of uh, box to represent the card, will be something where we have curved edges, one, two, three, and four. And then we have straight side lines, for instance, this one and this one. Hmm. Okay, so I can do that. That's not too bad. Because I'm going to be utilizing some UTF-8 Unicode characters, I need to bring in my old encoding function, which will look like this. We will put in the code for this in a second. At the moment, in order to really encapsulate an entire card, we want to be able to store all of these numbers in some kind of an array. We can do that. So let's go ahead and store some information about drawing cards. What do I want to store? I want to store the Unicode code point. So let's go ahead and make some kind of an integer here. Let's call this one uh, cards. Cards here will represent all of the Unicodes that we will need for our boxes. Now, I'm going to go ahead and say there are nine of them, and I'm going to arrange them in the following way. I'm going to arrange them as if they were in a 3x3 three three grid. So the first element of this array here will correspond to the top left character of my box. Okay, so let's go ahead and do that. I want this character here, so I want 256. And because it's in Unicode, I'm just going to go ahead and change this to hexadecimal, 256 and D. Cool. Okay, uh, I want the one, the, the next element here, to be one of the straight lines. And I'm going to use this one here. So let's go ahead and use OX. 2500 and it'll correspond to this character here in this in this row and column okay next I will grab the top right corner so I'm gonna grab this one 256 E next I will grab the left character the left hand side and I have a choice between this one and this one very difficult to see which one it is, but I'm going to go ahead and use the bigger one because that seems to be a little bit nicer. Two five zero two. Next, we will have a character in the middle, which when we are printing some kind of a, a card, there will be no, no graphic in the middle. So this one here can even be the good old fashioned space. Now space, I know for sure, has a value of OX20. I can look this up in, in, in an extended ASCII table and I can get the value of OX20. 
to be really precise in in accordance with this, I can give it two extra leading zeros here, but that's not ne that's not necessary. The character on the right hand side will be the same as the left hand side, so we can go ahead and copy this one there. The bottom left corner will be this character here, 2570. The character on the bottom will be the same as in, as in the first slot, so we can go ahead and copy that one. And on the bottom, I will go ahead and use 256F. Okay, so now I have all the Unicode information, all the code points, for all of the different edges in a card. Now keep in mind, I don't have to draw them like this. I can draw them like this. And that will make it so I have larger cards. So this, I want to draw patterns in this way here. This is what I'm going to do. These Unicode code points, they need to be stored in some kind of a character array. So let's go ahead and create a character array that will store the UTF-8 encodings for these Unicode code points. We'll call it card UTF. And I do have nine cards, but each one will have five characters at least. Because remember, all of the Unicode the UTF-8 encodings will be at least five characters. It's actually four, but we're leaving, we're reserving one character for the terminating, um, for the null terminator at the end. We can in initialize this with zero. And now we really just need a magic function that will go through all of these and encode this Unicode code point into its UTF-8 encoding as a character, as a character stream. Okay, well, that's not too bad. We can go ahead and write a loop. Here's how we do that. I have nine cards. I need nine conversions. And we can use our familiar function that we've previously defined here, encode as UTF-8. We'll set the target to be card UTF at I with the source code point at card at I. This will do the magic conversion function for us. Why don't we go ahead and make a function called setup and that'll and we can put all of this setup in there just so we don't clutter our main um, our main application. We can even put the setting of the code page and cons and clearing of the console screen Let's keep this in mind for now when we are drawing our cards. Next, I want to test this function, so I need to start writing this draw card function. Okay, that's not too bad. We can do this. Well, it turns out that uh, the first thing we'll need to do is set our color. Setting of the color just means that we will change our background, and I want it to be white. How do I know what it's going to be? Well, let's go ahead and take a look at my conversion tables here, and I'm going to start drawing with this 248 down here. 248 means white background with a gray foreground. So I want to set the color to be that. But I don't have a set color function. So let's go ahead and steal one of our set color functions that we've defined much earlier in the, in the program. I'm going to write its prototype here, and we'll copy and paste its definition that we had earlier. Another useful function to get is going to be our go to xy function, which again, we've also looked at prior in some of the labs. So without putting in the actual code for these, let's just use these abstractly for now. So now we want to draw the boundaries of our card. We already have a pattern here that we need to mimic. And remember that this pattern starts off in its simplest form like this. And each one of these numbers, they represent the index in this array. Both of these arrays contain pretty much the same information. However, the int card array will hold our, hold our Unicode code point, while the card UTF will hold the same code point but encoded in UTF-8 for printing. So we can go ahead and try to print exactly in this way. 
because they will be UTF-8 encoded, we need to print them as strings. Let's go ahead and do that now. I want to print card UTF, and I want to print boundary 0 here, which would represent the top left. This would represent the top. This would represent the top right. We can repeat this process to draw the entire card. This will just draw a square box. Let's erase this and clean up our code just a little bit, comment out some details here. If we try to run this code and compile it now, we'll be met with some errors. First of all, card UTF-8 is undefined because we have it only here as a local variable. We're going to cheat a little bit here and put this here as a global variable. I know, I know, very bad. Next, we need to realize that we have some functions here that we are trying to utilize in our codes, but they are not defined yet. So let's go ahead and comment them out. The only one we really need is this encode as UTF-8 function. Luckily, we can pull that from our previous code, and we can just copy and paste it here. I don't like to look at this code. I like to just minimize it so I can see more or less what's happening at a high level here. So I click this little button here, and that'll minimize it and collapse it. Let's go ahead and build the solution and see what happens. We still have a couple of problems here that we've used this set color function. Again, we need to go to prior codes and steal those codes and copy paste them here. Let's go ahead and do that now. Go to XY, we've seen this in the labs. Let's minimize that. Set color, we've seen this in the lab. Minimize that and get rid of it. Great. Let's give this compilation one more shot and hopefully everything should be good now. But I did forget to do a couple of things. For instance, I didn't actually call my setup function anywhere. So let's go ahead and do that now. I will call it at the beginning of my program just to initialize the code page and do our magic conversion functions and save all the results. Then we want to draw the card separately here. When we drew the card, let's realize that we haven't actually put in new lines here. We want these characters to appear above each other. So let's go ahead and put in new lines at the end of each of these printings. Let's build our solution and let's give it a whirl. If we go ahead and run without debugging, you'll see that we kind of get some gibberish. It looks like it's in the right way. It looks like it's in the right order, but where are, where are all the fonts? Well, it turns out that we need to run this in Windows Terminal, just like how we did when we did the character emojis. So let's go ahead and navigate to the folder that has my executable, and I know that it's called five draw cards. Oh, and look, voila, I have the beginnings of a card here. It's very small. Let's fix that. To fix that, all we have to do is just add more characters to be displayed here. I want to add more of the top boundary, more of the bottom boundary, more of the left boundary, and more of the right boundary. Now, in order to avoid extraneous typing, I've already typed that for us here. It'll look like that. Let's go ahead and build this solution and give it another shot. There we go. That looks like a much better, much larger card. One thing which you'll notice is that I've drawn in white background and after my program is done running, the white background persists. I don't particularly like that. Every time I have to write this clear command to get it back to normal. It would be nice if I didn't have to do that. Luckily, we can make a little function that will help us deal with this. Let's call that reset console color. Let's make it, let's put it right up there as a prototype. And at the beginning of my code, I'm going to go ahead and reset the console color. At the end of my code, I'm also going to reset it. And this is because the first time we run our console color function, we will load in the console color, the current one. And then at the end, we will reset it. The function here will do two things at once. I'm going to copy in some magic code for that. And I'm going to go ahead and just minimize it as well. You can take a peek on the inside, but it doesn't really matter at this point. So let's go ahead and close it up. If I build my program, 
and rerun my cards, you can see that the, at the end of my program, the console remains with its correct colors. This looks fantastic. Look at that. I can start drawing cards. I'm just zooming in and out here whenever I do this. Some of the aspect ratios look very clean. Some of them looks like they have a bit of gap in between. You'll have to play around and find a zoom level that works for you. I like this one. Looks pretty clear to me. Perfect. Next. Now that we've drawn the cards, let's see how we can actually utilize the XY here. The XY here means that I want to draw a card in a particular location. Can't I use the go to XY function to do that? So I can do that. I can put the go to XY function in front of each printf. And if I do that, the cursor will move to this location first, and then we'll go ahead and print this. It seems like we don't need our new line characters if we're just going to move it each time anyways. So let's get rid of those now. And each new line that we go downwards, we want to print underneath, we can just go ahead and manually offset each one. To make the pattern clear, let's do something like this. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Now we can draw cards anywhere on the screen. To prove that, let's go ahead and draw a few more cards here. I'm going to draw a 2, also make it a diamond. We haven't actually configured how we draw these yet, but I want to move the location to be 8 and 5. 8 on the X, 5 on the Y. Let's go ahead and build our solution and run it. And now, as you can see, we have two cards. Let's clear the console and run that one more time just to see it a bit more clear. You can see that the backgrounds are pretty much black here. They're supposed to be black, but they show up as blue. And when I'm drawing cards, they are white background with gray. And then I overlapped a drawing when I simply drew on top of it. Next, let's see if we can paint the entire background white. I don't like all of this blue here. I want everything to be white so that it blends really nicely with my cards. I don't want to see these boundaries. I'm going to have my clear screen function that I called earlier. I'm going to configure it now to do that. Let's go ahead and call the system command CLS. That'll get rid of all the other output in my console. I can go ahead and go to XY, 0, 0. And I'm going to attempt to print lots and lots of things there, lots of spaces, in order to take up space. How can we do that? A nested for loop. I think 40 rows should do, but let's start with 20 for now. And how many columns should we print across? I'm going to do, let's go up to uh, 100. That should do. And what are we printing? Nothing. We're just printing spaces. Because we are printing spaces, we need to first print, we need to first set our color. Well, we can do that with the set color function. Let's set it to the same color that we were using to paint everything else here. One final note about this is that at the end of my program, I want to do something a little bit special as well. I'm going to do something kind of interesting. I'm going to go to 141 or 30, let's go to 121. And here I will reset the console color and then print four new lines. What this does is whenever the program is going to terminate, instead of it terminating here on the last character and then it exits and then this gets overrid, overwritten to the screen, it'll move to the bottom and then all of this other junk that comes out from the console will be printed here at the bottom, leaving this entire space here for us to work with. Let's see if that makes a difference now. Okay, so things like this are kind of common. I can already tell that what we might need to do is expand our screen just a little bit. Aha, look at that. Look how nice that came out. Let's run it again. 
Oh, that is fantastic. If we bring this in a little bit, that should do it. Perfect. And now we don't have any other weird output. And look how clean our cards are starting to look. The next thing that we're going to draw is the suit and the number. Well, it turns out that like boxes have some Unicode characters, we can also utilize suits in Unicode as well. So we need these numbers one more time. Let's go ahead and put this to the side and do the same thing that like what we did for the cards. I'm going to put it up here. We'll call it suit. How many suits are there? Four. And they are the following Unicode code points. 2660, 2665, 2666, and 2663. And I'm going to put a little comment here for spades, heart, diamond, and clubs, because that's important. Like our cards, like our card edges, the suits also need to be encoded in UTF-8. So let's go ahead and do that as well. And we have four suits, and each one is again going to be encoded in at least five characters. Four, really, if we count the null terminator. We need to run our magic function that we did in setup. Exactly as we do for the card edges, we need to do for the suits. How many suits do we have? Four. We'll call this suit UTF and we'll take it from our suit code points. Now this will encode the suits in UTF-8. And again, we can print them in the same way. Where do we want to actually print these suits? Well, usually cards, you could print the suits right underneath the, right underneath the, the number. So the number would usually go in one of the corners, for instance, here and there. And then the suit would go directly uh, above it or below it, depending on if you're reading on the top or on the bottom. So we can do that here. We can draw them here. We need to make our subroutine for drawing also take into consideration the suit and, and the number. Let's do one first because it is a little bit easier. Let's do the suit. So suits here come in four varieties. S, D, so S for spades, D for diamonds, C for clubs, and H for hearts. When we pass it here, what we really want to do is we want to convert that into a number. So let's go ahead and do that. We'll call it a uh, suit number. And here we're going to put a bunch of if statements that convert between our suit as a character and our suit as a number. So we'll start with spades. And we will map this suit number according to what we had here. So when we have hearts, our suit number is 1. When we have diamonds, our suit number is 2. And when we have clubs, our suit number is 3. Great. Now what? Well, we want to somehow put the suits here and the numbers here. But I don't think it's a good idea to mess with this code. What we really should do is somehow just go ahead and paint on top of this to rewrite over what we've just written here. You can think of this like a painting algorithm. We always draw from the back to the front. Let's draw our suit in the middle of the card. How do we do that? Well, first we need to go to the middle of the card using our go to xy function. Our go to xy function will go to x plus 4 and y plus 3. And at that location we will print f uh, a UTF-8 character. Which character do we print? Well, we've already de decided which index from our array that we will print. Let's go ahead and run that code and see what happens. There we go. Now we have suits. Pretty cool. Spades here and diamonds there. Let's see if that matches what we had before. Spades here, diamonds there. Let's go ahead and 
make sure we draw a couple of more. What else do we have? We have hearts and we have clubs. And let's just add a couple of X coordinates here. Build the project again and draw it on top. I don't like these, so I'm going to I'm going to add more spaces. I really just want to see all the suits all at once. At least all of them once. Great. This looks fantastic. Now, what about the colors? Well, you can see here that the colors will not match. The colors for a card are not just gray. We need to actually come up with a color scheme for this as well. So let's go ahead and give the colors for this suit. Each one of the suits will have one color and there will be four colors in total. We can use our colors that we've decided here and we can pick red and black. So 240 and 252. 240 will be black, 252 will be red. Okay, not bad. Spades, the first one is going to be black, so this will be 240. The next one will be 252. The next one will be 252, and the next one will be 240 as well. So before we go ahead and print here, what do I want to do? I want to set the color. Let's go ahead and set the color. The color will be based on the suit number. Let's call this color suit just so it's a little bit more clear. And we'll use the suit number to identify which color we should have here. And then if we want to, if we rebuild this program and we rerun it, we should get our nice colors. Hey, this is starting to look like a real program. Pretty cool. So next, let's actually go ahead and print the numbers of the card. The numbers, they usually go at the top left and the bottom right of each card. So let's do that here. I'm going to go ahead and first of all go to the top left by saying x plus 1, y plus 1. That should give me to the top left. I'm going to set my color to be the right color for my suit because it should match the middle color and I'm going to go ahead and printf a, an integer which is just the number that was passed to me. This will print the number in the top left corner and now I'm going to print the number in the bottom right corner. I'm going to go ahead and guess and say that this is going to be at 7.5. I don't know why, I just think it's going to be right. Ta-da! Okay, so that works. Are we done? Well, not really. Here's why. Here we've only printed the numbers 2 to 9. But what happens if we want to print 11? Remember, 11 here is supposed to signify a jack. And 12 is supposed to signify a queen. If we rebuild our solution and rerun it, you'll see that 11 and 12 appear. This is not what we want, is it? Okay. Another thing that's happened here is, as you can see, 12 is printed out of the card. We don't like that either. So why don't we be a little smarter here? Okay, so let's do something like this. If the number is bigger than or equal to 2 and number is smaller than or equal to 9, then we can go ahead and print normally because any number 2 to 9 will be one character wide and will only ever be numerical. 10 we will do as a special case. So let's do that. Else if number is equal to 10. If it's equal to 10, all I want to do is just move the bottom right over to the left by 1. Okay, so let's just modify this one to be a 6. Let's make this an else. And let's have another else if. If the number is bigger than or equal to 11 and number is smaller than or equal to 14. Remember that 11 equals jack, 12 equals queen, 13 equals king, and 14 equals ace. Um, well, what do I really want to do? I want to transform these numbers into some kind of character. Because I want to print a J, a capital J, for 11. I want to print a Q for 12. 
Well, that's a little bit complicated, but we can do a couple of if statements here. If number is equal to 11, what do we really want to do? Well, what we want to do is we want to set one of these characters here to be some computed character. Computed here meaning that it will either be a J or it will be a K or a Q or an A. And we will use our if statements to figure that out. So if we have our computed character B, oops, pardon me. If we have our computer character B, the character J, when the number is 11, that should do. When it's 12, it'll be queen. When it's 13, it'll be a king. And when it's 14, it will be an ace. And now print the computed character. Oops, I think I ate up a bracket here. Let's go ahead and run this code. Oh, fantastic. But I think I made a mistake here when I copied the 6 from the 10. I don't want that. Let's revert this back to the 7. It looks like this one here is a little bit offset. And there we go. Now we can really do something. So as you can see, if you're willing to learn characters and strings, you can really make some nice displays. And now you can change this into some kind of a poker game, or you can change this into you know, war or go fish, whatever card game you want. Uh, I built a, a solitaire one and I made it jump around, but I will leave it to you to figure out how I did that. It all utilizes the exact same functionality that we've seen in these codes. There's nothing special in it. I'm just drawing on the screen. So I hope you've enjoyed lecture 10. I know it was a very, very long one, but as you can see, there's a lot of technical aspects to strings and characters that you really have to understand before you start using them. It's very easy to mess things up or get frustrated because things don't work well. Take it nice and slow and learn all the theory about how these things work, especially when it comes to Unicode characters. That's a, that's a tough subject for anyone. Finally, our question can be solved fairly easily. Now that we can draw any kind of card that we want, it just remains to get some user input and do some string comparison functions to identify what have we typed in. I'm going to leave that for you to do as it is rather trivial to do considering how far we've gotten on this code so far. And for those of you who've made it this far, here is the solitaire program that you might have seen from me. All it does is bounce cards around on the screen in a very, very nice fashion. And now that you've coded drawing cards, this should be a piece of cake for you as well. You have to figure out how to make something bounce around and draw it to the screen periodically. That's all you need to do. I hope you guys have fun in this lecture. I really do. Cheers.